Hi, I'm Megan, a bookseller at Literati Bookstore and the host for tonight's event. This evening, we're pleased to welcome Mark Prince and uh, Christopher Castellani to our At Home with Literati series in support of the lab. Uh, for our attendees, the chat is closed, but I'll be dropping links to purchase the lab throughout the event. You can also use the Q&A feature in your toolbar to submit questions at any time, and a selection will be asked at the conclusion of the event. A reminder that you can shop for more books in store at literatibookstore.com for curbside pickup and shipping to your home anywhere in the United States. Uh, now allow me to introduce tonight's author and moderator. Mark Prince is a recent graduate of the Iowa Writers Workshop and a recipient of fellowships from the Truman Capote Literary Trust, the Breadloaf Writers Conference, and the Sun Valley Writers Conference. He lives in Brooklyn, New York. Christopher Castellani is the author of four novels, most recently Leading Men, a collection of art, uh, essays, Art of Perspective. He lives in Boston. Uh, without further ado, I will turn it over to Mark and Christopher. Thank you, Megan. <laughs> Thank you so much, Megan. Um, so Mark, first of all, congratulations. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> it is so great to, um, to be here with you um, and to have this chance to celebrate the book with you um, and to hear you read a bit from it and to um, ask you my questions and have a conversation with you about it and then to um, to answer, to hear you answer the audience questions. Um, yeah. So, um, and I believe you have a reading to start. Um, for, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'll do a short reading and, you know, thank you, Chris, for being here uh, tonight and thank you to Literati for, for hosting us. Um, First, I'll give just a little synopsis of the book for those of you who haven't, who haven't read it yet. Um, so the book examines a turbulent mentor-mentee relationship between two academics at Oxford University, which loosely parallels the Latin Greek myth of Apollo and Daphne, in which Daphne narrowly escapes the advances of the god Apollo, but only by being turned into a laurel tree. So in the book, we follow an ambitious young American scholar who's sabotaged by her mentor. And in the sort of cat and mouse game that ensues, she finds herself doing whatever it takes to come out on top as she struggles to reclaim agency over her personal, professional, and intellectual existence. Uh, so that's a long way of saying that the book, uh, or that it's a book about love and revenge and about power and powerlessness and ultimately about how far we'll go for the things we desire. So that's my little spiel um, about the great, book. That's and a it's... great pitch, by the way. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> it sounds like a good version for like the movie, you know, the movie version of it. It sounds perfect. Yeah, anyway, the little ahead. trailer. <laughs> um, I'm just gonna do a, sh a short reading or, or not too short, but hopefully not too long either. Um, and just for context, you know, our protagonist, whose name is Tessa, is in Italy right now on an archeological dig. And she has a day to kill because a uh, supervisor of the dig is coming back and Tessa is not supposed to be there. So Tessa's co-conspirator Lucrezia tells her to sort of get lost for the day and find something to do. And so Tessa takes a, um, takes a train into Rome and uh, I'll, I'll start reading from there. Tessa glimpsed the crown of a stone pine at the end of Via Giacomo, evidence of the tree-lined edge of the Borghese Gardens. And by the way, I apologize to Chris for my Italian pronunciations. Um, she made the 11 a.m. entrance and was the first inside. She was immediately struck by the marble, the sheer quantity of it in the floors and the columns and walls. Other museum goers moved quietly around her, so many with audio guides, the gallery resembled a silent disco. Tessa continued her wander to the third floor and toward the Apollo and Daphne room, feeling the statue's presence before she even laid eyes on it. They faced away from her, her first glimpse, and this was not by accident, always disorienting. She saw the backs of two figures in motion, the whorls of Apollo's garment, like a hovering mollusk, the satiny curves of an arm, a hand, a leg, a breast, the statue require, required one to circle it, so that's narrative unfolded in motion, suitable for Ovid's passage that at 115 lines had its protagonist almost entirely in movement. A frond of laurel leaves burst from Daphne's left thigh, sprigs of foliage sprayed from her hair to her outstretched hands, darting up her leg was a sheet of bark, her mouth was a gape. 
Then Apollo's face in eerie serenity about Daphne's drama. He could see, perhaps, a crescent of her cheek, the tip of her nose, while the viewer was left to imagine what Daphne saw in this final moment, her screaming eyes pointing into the statue's negative space. Their bodies continued to twist as Tessa circled, then Apollo's toga curved around his torso, and she was again behind the figures. Tessa was always in awe of how Bernini could make marble seem so light and airy like a meringue, if he chose, or as dense and speckled as granite. She finished her first orbit, knowing she would do still more. She had bought a version of the statue for Chris, Chris is her mentor, here two summers before, a paperweight. It probably still lay somewhere in his house amongst his collection. Love, of course, meant ironically, love falling short. But Ben's love, and Ben is her ex-boyfriend, had fallen short too. What would his look like adapted to statue form, she wondered. It wouldn't be adapted to a statue, she felt suddenly. It couldn't move stone like that. It's a chase scene, someone says. Tessa turned to find the owner of this American voice, which was neither loud nor soft, but somehow pitched correctly for a museum. She took in a face, smooth skin, boyish, few freckles which brought out the brown of his eyes, handsome. Hollywood spends millions on chase scenes with actual cars to less effect than Bernini, the stone, he continued. Tessa found herself a green and began to circle the statue again more slowly. He followed her. Art historian, she said, over her shoulder. He bent forward towards her. I'm in film, he said. She laughed at his light irony. He didn't look like an actor. His quarter zip hung long and boxy. His expression seemed thoughtful and vaguely introspective. Screenwriter, maybe, or set design. Maybe you chose the wrong medium, she said, slightly provocative, continuing to start circle. Stone can be very stubborn, he responded. Not in the right hands, she nearly said, but didn't. She stopped to read an inscription on the pedestal underneath Apollo's grasping arm, two lines from Metamorphoses, in frondem crines and ramos brachia crescent, pes moto tam velox pigris radicibus hyret. And to foliage her hair, and to branches her arms grow, now sluggish roots cling to her swift foot. I didn't mean that exactly, he said after a silence. What did you mean, Tessa asked, a few hours later. An endless arcade of umbrella-shaped pines came silently past Tessa's reflection in the taxi window. Voices jabbered on the radio in Italian, and signs reared their indecipherable messages in the plowing white beam of the headlight. She had splurged on a taxi back to Isola Sacra, and in the dark, she recalled the strange day in company with this man, the statue man, quarter zip. They had left the gallery together, and after 20 minutes of wandering the Borghese gardens, she had made a joke about the ever-enlarging fact that they had not yet exchanged names, and they had continued to omit this basic formality through the early afternoon, relishing it, calling one another stranger playfully as they shared information, she talking on a surface level about teaching at Oxford, he admitting that his, quote, mediocre novel was being adapted into a movie in Rome. Rom-com, she asked, bank heist, he said. And he'd been invited to the set and then told summarily to fuck off when he tried to exert some creative control of which he had none. She had lived only in Florida and Oxford. He everywhere, North Carolina, Georgia, Washington, Texas. He was a Navy brat. They walked for hours. The sun wore gradually through the dark, bruising clouds. And on their way to Prati, Tessa glimpsed a Navy blue Maserati and who but Alberto, who is Lucrezia's boyfriend, stepping out of it, walking quickly onto a serpentine side street. She had become incensed. He was supposed to be in Brussels and quarter zip had gamely come with Tessa as she chased Alberto's clicking loafers to a restaurant, feeling strangely proprietary about Lucrezia's heart, wondering aloud what defense he would come up with, whether she would tell Lucrezia how Tessa would confront him. But when they'd entered the restaurant, she'd seen it was not Alberto at all. This man was older with silver in his hair, a craggy face meeting two adorable daughters and their grandmother for lunch. And following this, Tessa wondered aloud to quarter zip if she'd seen Alberto because of a latent envy of Lucrezia's relationship, a desire to see it dashed against the rocks of infidelity or mendacity. And quarter zip confessed to how he had discovered his girlfriend in LA cheating on him, how humiliating it had been, how it had led to him accepting the empty gesture invitation to come to Rome where he was now in limbo with a free room nevertheless at an expensive hotel near Termini. Their jaunt through Rome had gone from conspiratorial and fun to a more heavy and perhaps emotionally laden journey. 
And on their continued walk, Tessa found that not exchanging names had become something solemn and protective, insulating and permissive, a minor elision at first, which had widened and could contain more emotionally and into which they began to spill more personal details, childhood narratives, most embarrassing stories where they lost their virginities. She thought of Apollo and Daphne, not of the chase, nor of Daphne's wordless scream, but of the sensuousness of their bodies folding into one another. And a subcurrent of desire lingered with her through dinner in Charles Devere, where Tessa spoke about her father, his philosophical tyranny, his inability to question his own tenets, the way he needed the woman in his life to reflect back his putative worldview. Yet here in the pause when Quarter Zip used the bathroom and her fingers clutched a fold of table fabric, she felt a shift, the beginnings of resistance to this person and the sensation that she had trusted too far. Afterwards, when he began to direct their course back towards the expensive hotel, she didn't object and she thought maybe she could disappear into Quarter Zip's clean sheets, buy a new pair of shoes, get a massage, get drunk on martinis, let go. For a few seconds, it had seemed like maybe Marius didn't exist. She let herself slide into this possibility, its contours. They had a drink in his hotel bar, but finally it had become clear to Tessa that they had exchanged too much, that it would feel somehow wrong to exchange names to, that what had begun as an exciting game had led them to a strange and uncomfortable loneliness. And she felt her hold on something important slipping. She was slipping away. And when he signed... Bill and Dre again in Rome. What is this, Cinderella? Are you a pumpkin? At least tell me your name. It all felt innominously like her relationship with Ben, an encapsulation of its failure, her unwillingness to open up, to be seen. And yet the prospect of meeting this man again in Rome or even telling him her name gave her a shiver of repulsion, even now as the taxi pulled into the driveway of the Soprintenza lodgings and Tessa exhaled a breath of relief. I'll end there. That's awesome. Um, you know, I was thinking as you were reading it that like there's so, there's just, we could spend the whole hour just kind of mm -hmm. taking that apart because there's so much in, and it's probably one of the reasons you read that, that, that passage, there's just so, there's so much of the whole, so many of the themes of the novel are sort of contained in, mm -hmm. um, in, you know, in that scene, obviously the, you know, the, the, the sculpture itself, which, you know, everyone can enjoy um, on the, on the cover of the book um, and the Apollo and Daphne myth, but mm -hmm. also like, you know, that kind of like her sense of, like paranoia, withholding, like uh, suspicion, who's got mm -hmm. the power, how much do I reveal, how much do I mm -hmm. not? Like it's just this, this, this stranger and mm -hmm. yet, um, and, and, and there's, and yet it's like the, the, the relationships that she's having with the people in her department and her, and her, um, her mentor and all that are kind of weirdly playing out in these, in these different ways, just in this seemingly, you know, random or this random encounter. Uh, anyway, yeah. that was a great that was a great passage uh, to pick to kind of to kind of bring out the so many of the themes of the book. Yeah. Um, I didn't realize I wore my quarter zip too. During oh that. yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I just noticed as I was reading. See, it's all just so organic. You don't even realize. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so did the um, I'm going to ask you like the sort of basic like uh -huh. opening question of just like um, how did like how did the idea for this book come together? But I'll kind of like. Um, specify it a little bit by saying like, did it start with Apollo and Daphne or did Apollo and Daphne mm. come later? Like take mm. us through the kind of evolution of how the story came about. Yeah, it was, um, I mean, it all, to some degree I have to talk about when I was a teenager because when I was a teenager, I was like a big Latin nerd. And mm -hmm. I, um, I think to some degree, I thought that I would become a classicist personally. And so I ended up not doing that and becoming a writer instead. But to some degree, there was some wish fulfillment for me uh, mm -hmm. writing about classicists, like the life that I didn't get to live. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that was, you know, dating back to when I was a teenager. I mean, in this case, I kind of came upon this story almost by accident. I mean, I was in my first year in my MFA program at uh, Iowa and um, I was writing this novel length project 
about three young people, uh, one of whom was a, a classicist from Oxford and another who was a uh, ballet dancer who had lost his leg actually in the Boston Marathon bombing. And, you know, this project was not working for me and it was not working for my peers and everyone was bored of it. It was a disaster. Um, and at some point in my second year, I was, you know, on the verge of like giving up entirely and I had to put something up for workshop. Um, so I looked through everything I'd written the year before and found these few paragraphs written from the point of view of this Oxford classicist dissertation advisor. And they had a lot of energy to them. And they were the only things from the last year that I felt like I could salvage. And I wrote the first chapter very quickly after that and showed it to my class and it kind of struck a nerve. Um, and, you know, encapsulated in that chapter was this, uh, you know, academic, this powerful academic who is head of classics at this Oxford college named Chris Eccles and, you know, his star student, Tessa. And he was clearly, and I got this from those three paragraphs, romantically obsessed with her. Mm. And it was in, you know, the Apollo and Daphne myth has been with me since I was a teenager, uh, you know, as, a, as that Latin nerd. And it was in seeing the, seeing the intersection between their relationship and the myth and some of the, you know, more specific ways that that played out in the imagery and the resonances there, which we can talk about, you know, at some point. Um, it was in seeing that intersection that the novel began to sort of appear to me. And so, yeah, I think it's sort of, Apollo and Daphne was definitely there from the very early beginning. And it did in a way give me a blueprint with Tessa and Chris's argument about the meaning of a footnote in the beginning of the novel. It gave me a little bit of a blueprint for the collision course that the two of them, you know, end up being on. That's so interesting. So yeah, so you, so have, weirdly you were more grounded in the myth itself then it's like the myth came first, but a long time before, um, and and then the characters kind of kind of met met the myth in a way, and you put them together, yeah. you know, and um, that yeah, I mean it's 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 so it's it's so um, uh, it, it's so how it's so how writers work, right? Novelists work like these 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 connections that um, might seem somewhat random to other people to us or to us are so organic and to us just come yeah. come naturally because we're drawing from our own experience like in a way your own experience is Apollo and Daphne that you're kind of bringing to bringing to um to their you know to their relationship um, yeah. and, I, and I'm also really struck by so Chris came first as a character before Tessa Tessa really came first oh, okay. and then Chris was what placed them in Oxford oh I see okay yeah Okay. Yeah. Sorry. From when you, from, from what you were saying, you made it sound like the first thing you had written was the, was the, was Chris's, um, was Chris's character. Um, so I, I guess the first pages of what became the novel were uh -huh. Chris's character, but the, the character of Tessa had, you know, existed previously, but like kind of in another form. Got it. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and did you always know that you, um, that it was going, that both of them were going to tell the story? Um, or is that, is that like, because in, in this book we have both of their perspectives. It's mostly yeah. Tessa's story. I mean, it's mostly Tessa's novel in the sense that she gets, I believe, more of the airtime, at least that's certainly how it yeah. feels. Um, yeah, definitely. And, um, um, but it, but you made, it's a very conscious choice, especially in a, in a, um, in a, in a, in a, in a novel that has elements of, many elements of mystery and suspense and sort of who's yeah. double crossing whom to have both to have both perspectives um was a really i think really bold and really great choice that worked ended up working really well but so i just wonder like how you know if that was like that from the beginning or if it was more tessa's story at the beginning and then you brought him in or vice versa so i know it's a sort of nerdy writer question but no no i mean it's so funny because I mean, this is my first novel. And so, so many of the things I did were not choices. They were just like me gripping <laughs> in the dark for anything that worked. And um, with, uh, I would say that, you know, Chris, it, it was the short answer is that it was both them from the beginning. Um, you know, I'm a big fan of 
uh, thrillers in addition to every other kind of literature. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sort of restricted to highbrow and I'm not restricted to genre or thrillers or anything. I read everything, but I did notice as I was writing the novel that the switching back and forth between perspectives wasn't dissimilar to Gone Girl, for example, uh-huh. mm-hmm. and that there was a lot of tension and suspense that could be generated from those switches between point of view. And if I could get both of their characters to be real, fully formed people, then it would be, you know, it would be a good read <laughs> and something that I would want to read, um, you know, which is what I'm always trying to do when I'm writing is write something that I'd enjoy. Yeah, absolutely. It's definitely a fuller picture of the whole of the whole dynamic, obviously, of Apollo and Daphne, if you want to say, you know, uh, you can't tell the myth unless you tell it in a way from both from both yeah. sides. Um, yeah. And um, and so I, I just think it was a really a really smart choice. But again, I, I noted I noticed as I was reading just, you know, I don't I mean. I don't know. Every time I read something, I think, how would I have done this or would I have done it mm. this way? Right. And mm-hmm. um, and 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 I was reading it and I was thinking, like, again, this was really smart. And I, I think I would not have been as smart. I think I would have probably like told it only from Tessa's perspective. And it would have been a would have been, a, I think, a lesser book. Um, mm. And I think that um, and I love that you're drawing on other genres uh, because um uh, or at least in what you said, in terms of like thinking about how this how this book came together, because I I feel like that 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 we don't do that enough as writers that we're often kind of locked into um, the kind of quote unquote literary novel we're supposed to be writing mm, and shouldn't yeah. include X element or Y element or, or whatever. So I just think you have it's such a nice blend here of as we saw in the passage, like deep insight into the character. I mean, we're fully under we're fully in her point of view and getting really smart observations about the way that she's seeing the world and mm. you've got this like page turny plot um that um where you're like what's gonna who, who's gonna who's gonna come out on top here and so much of this drama around you know power and academia and just mm. and double crossing and all that stuff that um that that again i feel like like I wish more people knew how to do is what I'm trying to say. <laughs> and <laughs> I appreciated that, that it had that. So I was curious about that too, like about like the sort of plottiness of it, like how, yeah. did, like, cause that's not something that we get taught in, um, in our, in our MFA work. Like MFAs. Yeah. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I mean, I will thank you for saying that. First of all, I mean, it, it you make it seem like everything was, uh, I was like a puppet master or something in this, but I really wasn't at all. It was, um, you know, a lot of trial, trial and error, but like, yeah. The plottingness, um, you know, I found myself really interested in plot because I was reading a bunch of books that I didn't really like that much, but I was still finishing them. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what is it about this human need sometimes to, to find out what happens in the story? Like, what is that? I was really fascinated by that. Yeah. Um, and I found that I could boil it down to like a few different things for me as a reader. Mm-hmm. And one of those things was when a gross injustice has been committed. Mm-hmm. And there's like this human need to find out what happens and how it's resolved. It's like, you need this closure. Yep. And with Tessa and Chris, when I saw this injustice being committed, almost like happening in front of me with this recommendation letter that he writes for her, which basically sabotages her attempt to work at any other school. I, um, I saw that and I felt the injustice being perpetrated and felt myself realizing that in that you could create a story around figuring out how this is going to be rectified or figuring yeah. out from as a reader, as a, as a writer, as a consumer of narrative, how that injustice is going to be rectified. And so I think that some of the plot comes from that. And some of it just comes from my love of characters who have really strong desires. Mm-hmm. Um, and that creates plot in of, in of itself. And, uh, you know, Chris and Tess are different in some ways, but very similar in others. And both of them are kind of obsessive and driven for the things that they want. I was going to say drivenness, definitely like, um, you know, yeah. And obsession certainly like is, is the thing they do share, which of course, what makes them such great adversary, you know? Um, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and I mean, yeah, I mean, that that's such a smart point about like, kind of 
not all you need is a great inciting incident, but, but um, because most of us, and I'm putting myself 100% in this category, not you, like can have a great inciting incident and then really not know what to do with it. And, um, and, and, but I feel like that inciting incident in a way of, um, of, of that recommendation letter, which anyone out there, whether it wouldn't, anything you've applied for, anything you've done, the idea, the idea of seeing of the way it happens in the book, which I know is not a spoiler because it's essentially on the jacket, I believe, of mm. like finding out that this, this mentor, this professor who you've count, been counting on to further your career is actually sabotaging it. And then the way she sees it and the way she finds out about it is just so like, you know, heart pounding that, um, that it does kind of like all flow from that kind of like, pr like primal injustice, you know, that, that, yeah. that that she was done that that was done to her and so yeah that yeah. does that does drive the plot of being like will she get like will she either get revenge or get her get her um get her just reward and will he suffer any consequences from that yeah so, definitely um, yeah so that was that was really exciting to me um and um so i had other things i wanted to ask you um so um around there was something around that, but I'm gonna, I'll come back to it later. Um, okay. I'm curious about, um, so I, I, I told you briefly before the, before the show that um, one of the things that I, the, that I found myself doing was, um, was re like Googling some of the people mentioned in here and being confused when I couldn't find them. Because, <laughs> yeah. And uh, because there's a, there's a silver age poet, Roman poet um, named Marius that you, mention and translations of his work and and you write about you write about him in so convincingly and in fact you have and we'll get to this later like the poems <laughs> themselves yeah. um so i just of course assume that it was a real person um so i want i know and you're probably going to say like i just fell into it or whatever but i would love for you to <laughs> tell me like like that about that choice to 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 mm -hmm. to rather than talk rather than fashion a like real quote unquote like um uh li literary literary scholarly debate around in a, a poet that we know or whatever that you created um this sort of in, the, you know that you invented this poet and then created all of this around it like what yeah talk about that process what was pleasurable about it what was frustrating and all of that the fact the collision of fact and fact and fiction in there yeah, yeah. So. Let's see. I mean, I was definitely influenced by a book that I really like called Possession by oh, A.S. Byatt. Yep. Yeah. I was going to ask you if that was an influence because that was the first book I thought of when I read this book. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, Possession is about these academics who are researching, you know, fictional poets and they're kind of striving and there are some on top and some on the bottom. But yeah. the discovery about these fictional poets is going to launch them into sort of a new realm of uh, academic stardom, you could say. And so there was an inf that was a little bit influential for me. I really wanted to be able to have there be a discovery. And <clears throat> I knew it was going to be hard to do that with something that was real. Um, and I also knew it was going to be, you know, the, for example, Ovid, the poet Ovid, the he is so heavily traversed by scholars and over the millennia that it's very difficult to sort of invent something about Ovid. Uh, you know, that would be an a different project entirely. Mm -hmm. But inventing a fictional poet allowed me to do a lot of world building, which is something that I really like when I'm doing, when I'm writing fiction. Um, you know, a lot of people think of world building and associate it with like science, sci-fi or um, you know, these, these, these great novels from th that tradition, but there's a ton of it that goes into all types of writing. And so it was actually really fun for me to invent this fictional poet Marius and to invent the poetry in Latin and the translations into English. And it allowed, you know, a lot to happen in the novel that I wouldn't otherwise be able to do with you know something that was based on you know a real discovery or a real poet um yeah. so yeah honestly it was just my myself figuring out what i would enjoy writing the most and and kind of landing landing on that um 
But, you know, in the course of doing research, there was, there are all sorts of things that I learned that I would not have otherwise learned. And that's, you know, part of the fun of doing things like this. And, you know, as an example, um, with, with, you know, I kind of had this idea and have always had this idea of the literary canon as being like, you know, this menu that the present day society has chosen from the past and decided these are the best works. You know, this is reread uh, the Iliad or the Odyssey or the Aeneid um, because these are the best things that were written at that period. And I sort of learned in my research that in fact, so much of what existed at the time is not available to us, has been lost completely. Mm. It's like a ratio, it's like an iceberg ratio. Mm. And a lot of that is because of the fact that the printing press, you know, happened in uh, 1500 years after, for example, Ovid published mm. Metamorphoses. Mm. And so there was this selection bias that happened when these monks were copying manuscripts and it was a very laborious process and they decided to copy some things and not other things. Right. And in the course of you know, creating this fictional poet, which in some ways is dramatizing the reception of the Apollo and Daphne myth over the course of generations, mm. um, it's also very interested in what has been lost uh, in the canon and those selection biases that have occurred that are often along, you know, gender lines or other lines that, you know, deprive us of voices that we would otherwise have. Mm -hmm. And so that was something that was really fascinating for me to learn in the creation of this fictional poet that I never would have been able to learn if I was writing about Ovid or any of the other poets who still exist to us because they're literally all men. You know, there's a reason why they've been passed down over the generations. And sometimes those are not the reasons that we would normally be told or right. know of our own accord. Yeah. No, that's, yeah. That, that's also fascinating. And I mean, I, I, I think like, you know, I'd spent a little time in, in, in grad school in, um, in an English program. And, um, and I do remember that the most exciting, when people would come and give papers and, or whatever, you know, that the most exciting things that excited me the most were the, were the scholars who were doing that kind of recovery work, you know, where they were, where they were discovering people who, who hadn't been, who had been written out or had been erased for whatever reason, um, or, um, you know, or, or, or they were, or, you know, or they were uncovering, um, you know, pieces of people that we knew that had been also erased or, 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 yeah. or not, not put out there for other reasons. Um, and, um, and so, and, and I, I sense, as you're talking, I sense that kind of thrill that, um, that you, that you had in kind of like recovering this person who didn't exist, yeah. but, but in a way he kind of stands for, uh, or the, you know, Maris kind of stands for, um, what you're talking about. These kind of the, the people who weren't, who were, who, who were written out of, of history. Um, and you think yeah. about even now with, the fact that you know everything is documented and recorded, and and mm -hmm. there's so much access to um, to getting anything you do out there, whether it's you know uh, you know uh, putting it on your own blog, or it's a TikTok, or it's a or you're or you're yeah, yeah. in your basement and distributing on the street. Like like there's so many opportunities to get your work out there, and yet it's still there are still there are still all this all there's still all this gatekeeping and all of this. Um, mm -hmm. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, yeah, it's so selection biases, selection yeah. bias, exactly, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So things, you know, the more things change, the more they stay the same, I guess. Yeah. But, um, but <laughs> I also think that, um, you know, I think you made, I think like what also made it a really smart choice to not do something like to not have it be Ovid or someone very familiar is that then it becomes a distraction. Like then it's about then it's like you get the Ovid people, right? <laughs> Who are going to read the book and like have all kinds of things to say about the way that you dealt with Ovid, and 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 um, and that and that distracts from the the themes at the heart of the story that actually have nothing have less to do with Ovid and more to do with all the rest of it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Um, yeah. I just think that was, um, you know, that was 
that was really that that was just a great that was just a great choice. Um, but I was, it was I do remember like when I first read it, being like, wait, I haven't heard of this yeah, person yeah. before. Yeah. <laughs> have, since we're on that, I have to ask you about the poems. So, like, mm. um, you, I'm assuming you wrote all the poems, and um, and uh, and so and and how what was. I mean, are you a poet and, and what was that, what was that process like? And the Latin, like, talk, talk right. about <laughs> the, so, um, so m- most of the poetry in the book is experienced via translation. Okay. And there is a, uh, there is a character named Florence who is a student of Tessa's who is, you know, a talented translator. And so we get the translations of Marius's poems through Florence. <laughs> And Florence was really fun for me because I was trying to imagine a way in which these poems could be fun. Like these Latin poems could be fun because for me, because I'm a huge Latin dork as a teenager, when I read Latin, it was fun. And so I was trying to find a way to make this like real and spent a lot of time, you know, with poets who I love, like Gerard Manley Hopkins, who has crazy, crazy rhythm um, or songs that I find catchy. Um, mm-hmm. Like I spent a lot of time going through Eminem lyrics or Kendrick Lamar lyrics mm-hmm. and trying to understand what it is that makes them so intoxicating to me. Um, you know, things like internal rhyme or assonance or rhythm and how, you know, the lyricist can play with the expectations in a listener's ear and then do something different, but in a way that's pleasurable. And all of that fed into my writing of the poetry, mm-hmm. which in my mind, I was kind of like, if I can get this to work, it would be so cool because then all of a sudden it's real. And then, you know, this uh, fictional Latin poet is like real and this fictional island in which, well, the island's not fictional, but the island becomes real to the story. And so that was kind of the little challenge that I set myself with the poetry. And so it's in English, but there's also a little bit in Latin, which was very difficult. And I don't know if I really succeeded, you know, there might be some Latinists out there who will be like, mm, I don't think so. Um, but it did play a role in the sort of discovery process, which is almost like your Indiana Jones uh, moment in the novel. And I really wanted to have there be some Latin in it and some Latin from the fictional poet um, because it just felt more real to me if I could do that. Uh, that was a grueling process. I don't recommend it for anyone who's not. <laughs> <laughs> who doesn't have a deep, you know, carnal interest in, in, um, in writing Latin. But I, I, I did a lot of research on Reddit actually for this novel. And I ended up finding someone on Reddit who's just a freak genius and he composes Latin poetry and he helped me a lot with the composition process. Wow. So good things actually happen on Reddit. I had no idea. Yeah. <laughs> in some <laughs> corners of the internet, good things happen. That's amazing. No, I mean, again, you, you can sense and you're, as when you're reading the book, the, the sort of fun that you were having with this, you know, and, and I really truly believe that that, that that comes through like in the, in the writing and in the, and in the sort of success of the book itself, that if the writer, you know, the whole like cliche, like no surprise in the writer, no surprise in the reader. Um, I think it's true too, like no joy yeah. and no play in the, in the writer, no, um, no real enjoyment, you know, in, in the reader. Cause I, I do, yeah. I do really sense that coming through and it's like such nerdy fun. I mean, I was like <laughs> telling like, friend of mine I was like yeah there's a lot about a femur and a lot about yeah. a, a lot about like you know I forget the the, the the scansion what is the type of um the like the limping I am yeah the, the limping I am yeah. yeah exactly I was like there's a lot yeah. about that and they were like okay you know <laughs> right, I was yeah. like, no, it's really fun you know? yeah um so and I really do I really do think that 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 came through um Thank you. Um, so, okay, switching gears a little bit, mm-hmm. and I have a question, which we'll get to in a few minutes. And I want to encourage um, everyone out there to, uh, if you do have any questions at all um, about anything about uh, the book, if you haven't read it, uh, does it matter? Um, ask any questions you want. You can ask about the books are on Mark's shelves or my shelves or <laughs> anything else. Um, but uh, I wanted to switch, um, just switch gears slightly just to, um, uh, I was thinking about academia and, um, yeah. and I'd, ri- I'd written to you earlier uh, to say that, like, I wanted to talk about the viper pit, um, you know, that is academia and um, which I think you just captured like in this such, such, such visceral, in such a visceral way. Um, and I was like thinking about, do you know what Sayers law is or Sayers law? 
I've I don't really know. I've I've it's heard of like, it, but I don't actually know what it is. It's it's like I'll read it. It's just uh, you yeah. know, uh, in any dispute, the intensity of feeling is inversely proportional to the importance of the issues at stake. <laughs> right. This is why academic politics are so bitter, right? Yeah. <laughs> like, like the lower the stakes, like yeah. the higher the you know, the, the higher the intensity of feeling, right? Um, and of course, like for the characters, the stakes aren't technically low. I mean, they it is their livelihood. Right. But in these, I'm thinking of, and I won't spoil anything, but I'm thinking of like the conference at the end of the of, yeah. the, of the novel, which is so wonderful, and um, and all that. Just that, like people are, you know, have such intense feelings about things that, you know, 99.999 percent of the world I could not care less about, and yet we'll fight each other like to the death, yeah. you know, yeah. to, you know, and <laughs> um, and again all the all the shifting loyalties, the suspicions, the paranoia, the self-preservation, the lack of trust, the ambition, the power plays um, that all go into that is all kind of endemic to academia. And so I was wondering if you thought of the book as in any way a kind of not send up, it doesn't strike me as a send up of a book, but it does strike me as having something to say about, about just about, about something related to all that I've just blathered about. So yeah, yeah. throw that out there. Yeah. Too. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, it's, it's interesting that you quote Sayers law, which I hadn't heard before, because mm-hmm. I do think that there's an element of scarcity, especially in the humanities in academia right now, that probably contributes to this, you know, I, I guess you could call it a inverse ratio between the stakes as most people would consider them and you know, just the level of bitterness or deceit or conspiracy or, you know, uh, all, all those things that you mentioned. But I also think that, you know, and, and, and I don't, I I do think that there are elements, sometimes it feels like a little bit of a parody, but there's also like real love for what they're doing from, from the author, from me. Um, it's part of why I chose academia and part of why I chose classics, because I can empathize with their passions. Um, so there's real love for that from me and from the characters. And I also think that for most people reading this book who could not care less about Ovid or Latin poetry, or, you know, don't, don't, it's just not a part of your life. Like it is for 99% of people. Um, I think part of the fun is that with fiction is understanding what the stakes are for those characters and, actually inhabiting their their spaces and their desires and their conflicts and i think that when the reader does that the stakes actually do matter in the same way that they matter to those to those characters Um, yeah but yeah i mean there are with in academia there are you know these asymmetric power dynamics that mirror those in every workplace environment, but can be so much more extreme. Um, Mm -hmm. And it was strange, you know, researching it. And and I, you know, know a lot of people who are in academia who have, or who have done the the PhD. And so I've kind of absorbed it, you know, by osmosis. Um, But I think that that also fit the Daphne and Apollo narrative, just as Mm -hmm. the Daphne and Apollo narrative fit that, you know, it was kind of a, puzzle piece coming together so so yeah I mean academia was a was I felt a good setting for the novel and it was fun for me to do Mm -hmm. and um yeah I'm sorry would you did you want to okay and and I think it's something that's fun you know for for everyone just like any sort of workplace environment can be totally but I think I just want to emphasize something you said because I think it's again exactly right that it doesn't work unless unless they do, unless Tessa in particular, like does really love what she's doing. Like she does yeah. have to believe in, like she does it, it, it like all the research she's doing. And, and, and it, if it's just about her getting a job and it, it's not, yeah, not exactly. interesting, you know, yeah. that's not about yeah. that. I mean, and, um, and so it only works, it only works because, or, I mean, it works, it, it really helps to make it work that, 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 as you said, she she does actually love this love this yeah. stuff and live, and live and breathe this stuff and yeah. but also you as the writer have to convince us yeah as, like why like that she does love it and how she loves it right and i think you right. do such a good job 
of um, of doing that, and all the all the details of the poems and the limping I ams and the and uh, the arguing over you know detail you know, various various elements of of their classics work like yeah. all, all those details add up to just convincing us that that this actually does matter to them and then now it matters to me the reader because it matters to them right um, yeah so. yeah there's um there's a quote that I like from from someone who I, I think you know, uh, Laura Vandenberg came to oh, Iowa yeah. and she gave a, a class and she was talking about layers of characters mm. and like she used an ocean metaphor and there's like the surface and then like the murky depths and then the layer where there are all those alien fish, um, mm. which she used. And, and I remember I have a note from it and I just had alien fish written <laughs> on the bottom. And part of, part of the fun of writing Tessa was myself discovering that her interaction or engagement with these texts actually comprised a good portion of that like alien fish element of her character, which is like yeah. so deep and, and, and ephemeral um, and, you know, ineffable as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, that was, that was uh, the fun part of, of really writing her and writing the literature. That's great. That's great. And gosh, I love Laura's work so much. And there's so it's, her work is like all alien fish. And I just love it. Yeah, yeah <laughs> you know, exactly. it's, it's fantastic. It's uh, operating on that level. Constantly. Yes, totally. I love yeah. it. Um, so I want to take one of the questions from the audience, which mm. um, someone asked, and it's a really good question about writing across gender. Um, um, the, 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 the questioner asked, can you talk a bit about writing across gender? How did you capture so well the experience of a young woman or what sources did you use to inspire that? Uh, love the book. So, <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been asked this um, a few times, and, and it's a great question. It's something that you know didn't come, you know, wasn't first times a charm, uh, as my sort of peers in the workshop could, could tell you. And you know, it was a it was a process, and I found that as an example, I was writing these tense confrontation scenes between Tessa and Chris, and there was something, my, my peers were talking about how she just didn't really seem intimidated at all by him. And, and they were a little bit just confused by that. Um, and I realized that when I was writing Tessa, I hadn't really left my own body. And when I imagined her like looking up at him, as opposed to, uh, I was previously think, imagining myself looking down at him because I'm taller and I just hadn't uh, you know, made that shift. Uh, it, it began to like help me get into uh, like the physical space that she inhabits. And there were other things that helped like that, like going on Reddit and going to um, female fashion advice and learning about, you know, different, you know, objects that would be part of Tessa's reality, but that are not part of my reality, like the slingback shoes that she's wearing, you know, in the last few sections of the novel. Um, but then at the end of the day, it's just, you have to be writing not a female character, but writing Tessa, who is a female character, and making that doing having the character do the things that that individual would be doing. Yeah, I'm thinking. Yeah, that's that that's, and I'm sure obviously you have readers along the way. After you know your, I don't know how much your agent or editor like when when what their what their and in terms of their their genders or how they and how that impacted it. But um, I've always been grateful when I have, when I've written across difference of having people read it and give feedback on it um, in, yeah. the, in that way. And, so. and my, my editor at Norton was so helpful for that as well. Um, you know, right. she's almost like the target audience um, <laughs> and same age, same age and, and gender oh, yeah. as Tessa. Yeah. yeah. And so that was, that was a huge help as well. Cool. I see this, like, I have a question that I, is related in my mind, but um, yeah. <laughs> um, I think with the character of Chris, um, he, it seems like you, like, he, he's, he's obviously does these sort of horrible things, but, um, yeah. but, um, but he's not, he's not a pure, I mean, he's, you, 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 you give him another dimension um, with his mother um, that, that I, I feel like was it was an effort to humanize him in some way, or at least to give him to make him not seem like all he did all day was think about how to destroy Tessa and and yeah. also also love her at the same time. So like, so I was yeah. curious about that those those elements of of, of the story um, and yeah. his, of his character um, and and how you drew him as a character. 
Yeah. I mean, at first, Chris was, wasn't that difficult to write because he's so badly behaved that he drove a lot of the plot and, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, he sort of does thing, maybe some of the things he does would occur to some people, but most people would be like, no, I'm not going to do that. Cause I have a, a conscience. Right. Whereas Chris doesn't have that, but right. Chris became more difficult to write as the novel went on because he doesn't empathize. He's not that large of a person in the sense that he does not contain multitudes. He is kind of a malignant narcissist. Right. And, um, I needed something to, because I I really don't like flat books like that where a villain is just a villain and is two dimensional. I love a good villain. um, And the, and, and Chris's mother was a way to, you know, short, sort of depict his uh, relationship to woman in a more nuanced way uh, Mm -hmm. than just with Tessa. And you know, I got feedback that it was good that it humanized Chris, but it wasn't really my intention when I was writing it. I was more just, um, you know, exploring something that felt like it was fruitful. Um, But I do think that that was important because, you know, I like to have, you know, there's no such thing as a 100% bad person, generally speaking, you know, people exist in shades of gray. And I think that the book should reflect that, you know, aesthetically. And that is, again, the merging of sort of different genres or whatever, because if it were a different genre, he could he could just be a bad guy, you know, but that's not yeah. what we're doing. Yeah. And yet, like um, in literary fiction, I feel like there aren't enough kind of bad guys. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so like in a way, like you got the best of both worlds there. And and also mm-hmm. I do think it, in, it increased the suspense because if you see a character who does have tender qualities and you all and you see them doing these other things that are not tender and are treacherous, you yeah. kind of wonder like how much do I really know him or how much does she really know exactly how yeah know him, how much does he know himself you know yeah um, yeah and so I asked you a little about this earlier but some uh, one of the audience members is asking about the about the suspense um, mm-hmm. um they say a lot of the conversation tonight was about the latin etc I'm interested in how you actually went, went about writing such a suspenseful novel so we touched on that earlier mm-hmm. but I was wondering if you did like um like like uh if you did kind of plot it out and and like you know like uh, think about think about the tension because it does it yeah. does really build and it does culminate in this really satisfying way so yeah yeah i mean i think that a lot of the suspense did come from you know i guess i, I as i mentioned earlier like the injustice that is committed and the reader's desire to sort of see that you know righted although and then i i also think you know one of the things that i picked up when I was writing the book that I think was helpful for me and maybe would be helpful for others is just always coming back to this idea of like intention and obstacle. Mm -hmm. Uh, For me, I was always thinking about, you know, what are the characters intentions or what are their desires and what is the obstacle to that desire? Because that is something that creates tension, especially if you can get the reader to believe that the character really does desire that thing. And it's, you know, maybe something worth desiring. And so, you know, a lot of the tension, I think, comes from Chris being an obstacle to Tessa and then Tessa being an obstacle to Chris and both of them working against each other. Um, And so for me, that was that was helpful for creating, you know, tension and suspense. Um, Yeah. yeah. And I, I also think because Chris is like such a loose cannon, there's Mm -hmm. suspense there because as you said, and I think this is really astute, like we don't really know what Chris is capable of and Mm -hmm. Chris doesn't even really know what he's capable of. And if you really can feel that with a character, then there will be a feeling of suspense for the reader, for sure. Exactly. And again, to repeat what I said earlier, like they're such good, they're such a good match for each other that it it would not have worked well if, if, I see this happen a lot when I read in, you know, in workshops and manuscripts and stuff. Um, writers, and again, I do this myself, we set up characters who like, act, one is clearly overmatched by the other. And yet you're asking mm. the reader to kind of engage in the battle between them. You're like, but no, like one is clearly mm. going to, you know, <laughs> like- Prevail, yeah. Not, yeah, it's not enough, of a, not enough of a match for the other. And I feel like you just match these really well. Um, mm. Uh, this will be a quick answer, I think. Do 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 any of the um, names of the characters have any special significance? Tessa, Chris, other than making a villain out of your former 
uh, workshop leader at Breadloaf. Like, I don't know if that had. <laughs> I was going to say, <laughs> here, no, no, there's no relation to this. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, uh, Christopher Eccles happened by accident. Eccles, I used to really love James Joyce when I was in college. I was like one of those guys and I still love Dubliners and Eccles Street is the street that James Joyce lived in, oh, nice. lived on in Dublin. And I, that just came somewhere out of the depths of my consciousness. Huh. And Tessa, I think I was just, I was writing char a character named Tessa for like 10 years, like <laughs> since I had started writing fiction and she was always changing. And so that was just the name that I had, maybe because I don't know anyone named Tessa, it was, it was easier. Um, and then I also, for a lot of the minor characters, I used names from my like kindergarten teachers and <laughs> first grade teachers and stuff like that. I um, love that. Yeah. It's a way of including yeah. people in the book, right? It's really yeah. fun. <laughs> yeah. That's very cool. Um, somebody asked about your, your research for translation, and you had mentioned the Reddit elements of it. Are there, is there anything mm -hmm. else about the research of the book, the research that you did for this book that is that that you'd want people to know that was particularly interesting or, or um, surprising yeah. or frustrating or anything like that? There's, um, yeah, and there's a whole note in the, you know, at the end of the book about the, the research and some of the, some of the things that really stuck out from doing the research, but there were, you know, minor Latin poets for people who really want to like nerd out about this, for example, in the appendix to Buliana, um, I won't say too much about this because it might contain a spoiler for the novel and you have to read the book. Um, yeah, reading reading minor Latin poets uh, helped with the poetry. Reading some of you know what we have from some female Roman poets, the mm. fragments, um, really one of them in particular, and um, you know, and then there was a lot of research about the place. There's an island in the novel called Isola Sacra, mm -hmm. and reading about that from a lot of different sort of angles, like even like scientific papers about archaeology there, mm -hmm. helped make the place become real. Uh, but there was a lot of kind of like layering that went on there with the research. That's great. That's excellent. Um, so we're coming upon uh, the end. Um, but I can I just ask one more question? Is that cool? Of course. Yeah, um, I hope so. <laughs> just, like, <laughs> just like, how has this been for you? It's your first novel. Um, uh -huh. And um, what has it been like to have mm -hmm. a novel in the world and the response from readers and um, any angry Latin scholars or anything like that? <laughs> like any, like just in general, how has it been for you? I mean, it's been really, it's been really fun. Uh, mm -hmm. I've, it's been kind of a, a, a dream come true, like a, a, a really fun launch for me. I mean, obviously if I could go back, I would have changed it so that Omicron was not <laughs> sweeping the world while it was happening and everyone could be in person and hang out. Uh, but aside from that, I think it's gone really, really well. Um, it's so much fun to have readers respond to something that you've written uh, for the first time and strangers. That's not something that I had the privilege of experiencing until now. And it's not something that I think I'm ever going to get bored of. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I mean, there have been some, there's some people who uh, haven't gotten on board with the ending. And mm -hmm. I think that the ending is, is controversial and dramatic and you, the readers will have to read it and decide for themselves. Um, but yeah, I mean, overall, that's, it's something that I thought was possibly going to happen because I knew it was controversial right. and, um, and yeah, overall, I, I really have, have no complaints. Right. And I so wish, I wish this was a book club instead of a reading. Cause I so wish we could like talk about the ending. <laughs> like, right. um, yeah. I mean, I, you know, like I would tell you, like, if I, if I didn't, I thought it worked super well. I love, I, I just thought it all just it made total psychological sense mm -hmm. to me and, um, and, and it was dramatic and it was satisfying and, and all of that I can, but again, I don't think it's, and I, I know, you know, this, like, it's not a bad thing for it to be polarizing because then yeah. you get people wanting to read it in order to have an opinion about it. And so yeah. there's, there's nothing better than, better than that. So, yeah. um, so I just want to say, last thing I want to say is just congratulations again. Um, it's such, you know, I, I read it when it was in galley form and I went, mm -hmm. Do we lose Chris? Oh no, it looks like we lost him. Um, oh, okay. But so you cut off there for a oh, second, no. but mm -hmm. 
<laughs> it looks like we've reached the top of the hour. Thank you to Mark and Chris for joining us on At Home with Literati. Um, and a reminder to buy the book. Uh, the link is in the chat. But have a good night, everyone. <laughs> okay, thank you. Good night. Thanks.